So, from the beginning. So I called this Spark, but I feel like it has another title, which I didn't come up with on time. But, um, does anybody know anything about the Jack Pine? Okay. Well, it's a type of pine tree where the seeds are in the cone, and it's not open like this most of the time. It, the cones, as they're growing on the tree, they get smoother and smoother as the tree matures. And without the right conditions, they can stay in there for years. But the thing that causes the seeds to come out, it's not quite what you'd expect. They, these trees actually need a forest fire or something equally hot to release the seeds. And it seems really kind of weird that they actually need fire. Like, you'd think that would destroy them, but it doesn't. Well, they, they only live a short time, but that's what these trees need. And there are creatures that are dependent on this specific type of tree. There's like a certain type of bird that will only nest in these trees. So there's that, and then it provides, their, their needles have the right type of makeup in them for like blueberries to grow, which feeds other creatures, and it like creates this whole environment, all because this tree, mm -hmm. forest fire life, which is bizarre, but that's how it works. But, um... And that sort of ties in with this, the, the seeds, you know, they're, they're small because they're, you know, little seeds. But it's been mentioned numerous times that moves of God are often begun by something small. And I think where I was going with this was forest fires can start with a tiny little spark in just the right spot at just the right time. You know, smoky, barren, hole. Mm -hmm. Only you can prevent forest fires. Um, but in the same way, some of the greatest fires, as I just said, began with a right, a small spark in the right place at the right time. It's not something you can really predict. Um, you can't predict the wind. Um, and that's not quite where I was going, but somehow in my studies, I went from studying this to studying the, and the effects of forest fires to looking up the word small in the Bible, in different situations where God used little things to do big things. And um, it, it's the, the same way in, in nature, like the mustard seed, which Jesus mentions. Um, I looked that up, too. And it's actually not a proper tree. It's, it's actually a shrub that just spreads everywhere. It's it's pretty much, in the U.S. at least, it's an invasive species, and it can take over fields. Just from one tiny little... I mean, if you think about that, what was Jesus saying about our faith? Like, if you have this tiny little speck of faith, it's like a crazy wild plant that gets everywhere. I mean, that's really encouraging. <laughs> um, so it, that kind of puts it in a completely different perspective. And here's what he said. He said, How can I describe the kingdom of God? Let me illustrate in this way. It is like the smallest of seeds that you can plant in a garden. And when it grows, it becomes a huge tree with so many spreading branches that various birds make nests there. It's a tiny little thing, and it creates a whole environment for life. I mean, really, it's it's maybe the size of a ballpoint pen's tip, like mm -hmm. tiny, yeah. and it provides all that. So, oddly, I I was like, okay, what else has tiny little seeds that grow as huge? And I was like, what what size is the redwood seed? And it's only the size of a tomato seed. So can you imagine like somebody giving you seeds and you don't know what they are and you plant them and suddenly you get this huge thing. <laughs> I just had that little thought in my mind. But looking further into small things, um, I went into a story with Elijah. 
he was, um, let's see, he had declared a drought in the land, and God, um, told him, go away from where you are, turn eastward, hide yourself by the brook Cherith, not Cherish, Cherith, which is to the east of the Jordan. It shall be that you will drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up, because there was no rain in the land. So, famine, drought conditions, in Israel specifically, because Judah was a separate kingdom at the time, all because the prophet declared it so, and God provides for him by telling him to go to a specific place, and he sends ravens, which would have been an unclean thing. So he's providing for him in this really bizarre fashion, if you really think about it. And it doesn't say quite how long this was, but it, it, the brook dries up because no rain. So God s tells him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to S Sidon, outside of Israel, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he went, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow, widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her, and he said, Please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. And she was going to get it, and he called to her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl, and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I am going to gather a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. So she's talking about she's going to make their last meal. This is the last thing that they have to eat. So Elijah says to her, don't fear, go and do as I've, as, as I've said, but make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me, and afterwards you may make one for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the oil be empty, until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. So she went and did this, according to the word of Elijah, and she and her, he and her household ate for many days off this tiny little bit of flour and oil. The bowl of flour was not exhausted, and the jar of oil did not become empty, according to the word that the <coughs> Lord spoke through Elijah. So God sends him to an, a Gentile widow, not, not an Israelite, a Gentile, and she's just about to prepare this last meal when, when he shows up. And when he asks her for food in, in faith, she prepares it for him. She has this tiny bit of faith, and she, she goes ahead and she does this, even though it could mean this is your very last meal and you're giving this away. And God provides for them for many days, not just that one little meal, but continuously. And it started with that one little loaf. And oddly enough, Elisha encountered a similar situation, except it wasn't quite the same. And it was a certain of the wives of the sons of the prophets. She cries out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servants fear the Lord. And the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. I can't imagine the hysteria she must have been going through. I mean, this was serious. She had nothing. And they had debts to pay. And the way they paid debts back then, they take away your kids, they make them slaves, and you know, that kind of thing. So Elisha says to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she says, Your maidservant has nothing but a jar of oil. Now it's interesting that she mentions a a jar of oil, because it's like, if you think about it, you, you're, you have nothing to pay your debts, and you randomly say, 
I have a jar of oil. Who thinks to say that? I mean, I wouldn't be like, I just have a loaf of bread in my fridge, you know? But he says, go borrow vessels at large for yourself and from all your neighbors, even empty vessels. Do not get a few. Specifically says, do not just get a few of them. Get as many as you possibly can. Yeah, I mean, this is, he's expecting something big here. Mm. And you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons and pour out into all these vessels. And you shall set aside what is full. So they're doing this in private. Just them and the Lord, basically. So she went from him, shut the door behind her and her sons. They were bringing the vessels to her, and she poured, and she must have been really concentrating on this, because when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there's not one more. And the oil stopped. Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, go and sell the oil and pay your debt. And you and your sons can live on the rest. Now, she not only had enough to pay her debt, she had enough to live on after that. Which, that's a lot. And that's from one, one jar. So, it ended with an abundance of oil and freedom from debt. And she took the step of faith even though she had very little to work with, she had just one jar of oil. So another creative miracle, and this time it's in Jesus' days on the earth, was the feeding of, the, of I call it the feeding of the 5,000 plus more, because it says 5,000, but there were also women and right. children, and there's no way of knowing exactly how many people, I mean, it's got to be a lot. But um, there's, there's more than one... I mean, each of the Gospels has a telling of Jesus feeding thousands, um, but I went with Luke and John because those I have those in the Passion Translation, and that's really my favorite. But um, I'm starting with Luke, and it starts with months later. The apostles had been out doing ministry and stuff. They returned from their ministry tour and told Jesus all the wonders and miracles they had witnessed. And Jesus, wanting to be alone with the twelve, quietly slipped away with them towards Bethsaida. But the crowds found out about it and took off after him. And when they caught up with Jesus, he graciously welcomed them all, taught them more about the kingdom of God, and healed all who were sick. So he's, he's like, I just want to hang out with the guys, basically, like, like, it's kind of like when we want to have, like, a team meeting together, if we did that, and then suddenly, like, all of Gloucester showed up at Karen's house, or something, like, <laughs> can you picture this, like, this whole <laughs> city shows up, and the news guys are out there, and whatever, and <laughs> just crazy stuff, and we decide, okay, We'll teach them. Yeah, exactly. Who says it won't happen? No soup for you. Extra stories to your house. So as the day wore on, the twelve disciples came to Jesus and told him, "It's getting late. You should send the crowds away to the surrounding villages and farms to get something to eat and find shelter for the night. There's nothing here to eat in the middle of nowhere." So they're starting to get a little uncomfortable. <laughs> They're realizing this is a lot of people, you know, Jesus healed everybody that was sick, but this is a lot of people, and that they are most likely quite hungry. I mean, it's probably been a long day, you know, people get hungry, and they point this out to him, and he says, you have the food to feed them. Now you can imagine <laughs> what they must be thinking when they hear this. They're like, what are you talking about? This is thousands of people, and it's just us chickens here. So <laughs> they say, all we have are these five small loaves of bread and two dried fish. Do you really expect us to go out and buy food for all these people? They're doing the math. There's nearly 5,000 men here with women and children besides. This is a lot of people. 
And he tells them, have them sit down in groups of 50 each. So there's something stirring up here. He's, he's got something in mind. So after everybody's seated, he takes the five loaves and the two fish, and gazing into the heavens, he gives thanks for the food. Then in the presence of his disciples, he breaks off the pieces of bread and fish, and he starts handing them to the disciples, and he gives more and more to them. And they're distributing it, and it multiplies before their eyes. So everyone eats until they're full, till they're satisfied. And afterwards, the disciples gather up the leftovers. You don't want to waste any of that. And it came to exactly 12 baskets. So he's, he says, you know, you have enough food. You have the food to feed them. And, um, and, and they're thinking, like, what, what is he talking about? Um, but uh, I imagine this, like, groups of 50 with at least 5,000 plus, that's like 100 groups plus more, this is a lot of work for them. They're, you know, running around, giving the food out, and, you know, he blesses the food, and um, they end up with a whole lot more than they started with. I mean, five loaves, <coughs> two fish, 12 <coughs> baskets, that's like, that's a lot. I mean, everybody had more than enough leftovers to feed them for like a week and a half, you know? That's a, that's a lot of food. <laughs> so, I mean, in John, um, same thing. People are following Jesus everywhere. They, they were really hungry for, for the bread of life, you know? They, they were hungry spiritually so much that they were basically chasing after him. Like, they wanted to be near him. That's exactly what... John says. He says they wanted to be near him. So I, the thing I find funny about, about John's version, it, it's almost like he has a closer picture of what's going on because it, he says specifically, Jesus turns to Philip, like he names who he's talking to, and he said, where will we buy enough food to feed all these people? I mean, <laughs> he's, he knows what he's about to do, but he, he wants to stretch their faith, but it's just kind of funny, like, because Philip's like, well, if we were going to give everybody just a snack, it would take the better part of a year's wages to pay for it. Like, I, I'm sure I would respond similarly, like, wait, what are you talking about? It would take, you know, <laughs> I'd be doing the math, but just then Andrew, Again, John names the person, speaks up and says, Look, here's a young person with five barley loaves and two small fish. But how far would that go with this huge crowd? Which I, I really identify with. I mean, have you ever... You, you, there's something going on and everybody's trying to solve this problem. And you're thinking creatively or you're trying to and you come up with something and it seems so brilliant but as you're speaking it out you're like wait um huh that that doesn't quite hmm <laughs> and you sort of trail off but there was just it, it seems like um there, there must have been like a measure of faith with what he was saying even though he sort of realized halfway through um that's not quite, you know, that's not quite going to do it. Um, there was something going on here. And as perplexed as the disciples were, they'd hung out with Jesus for a little bit at least, and they'd seen him do all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, he turned water into wine, he'd healed all these people, he'd cast out demons and all this stuff. So they knew that he could do all these wild, crazy things you know, heavenly signs, wonders, and healings, and, you know, they knew somebody here has a solution, like, Jesus, you know, he did all this stuff. So, Jesus, he, he doesn't say anything about, you know, 
Well, yeah, of course it's going to work. All he says is have everybody sit down. <coughs> and on the vast grassy slope, it says over 5,000 hungry people sat down. Jesus took the barley loaves and the fish, gave thanks to God. He gave it to the disciples to distribute to the people. Miraculously, the food multiplied with everyone eating as much as they wanted. So it's like a all-you-can-eat miracle picnic, basically. I mean, they could eat as much as they wanted, and it, there was plenty. And so when everyone was satisfied, Jesus tells his disciples, now go back and gather up all the pieces left over so that nothing will be wasted. I, I guess you can kind of gather from that that God doesn't like to waste anything, which, that's kind of, that's nice. Um, so the disciples fill up the twelve baskets of fragments, a basket of leftovers for each disciple. Um, so there was abundance and yet more abundance, like this was beyond abundance. So short. God uses the small to prove himself awesome. He uses it to make a statement that he can do anything, anywhere, with anyone or anything. He uses the small, the overlooked, the broken, the inadequate, and the awkward. If you look at the people God's used throughout history, and in the Bible, and all over, um, you might notice they're not perfect. I mean, nobody is, but they, you know? Um, in fact, most of the time, there are people that man would not pick for the job. It just, they're the least likely to get picked. Like, they're, if there's a game going on in school, they're the last one picked for the team. <laughs> But any time I start feeling small and inadequate, um, at least lately, I start thinking of that little mustard seed and how it, you know, it, it's so prolific. And David's mighty men, which I didn't mention earlier, but how they were, you know, they were the, the rejects, basically. And David took them in, he fathered them, and they became so much more through that time with him and you know because David had a connection with God they also ended up through yeah but various people that God has used for different things people who similarly felt inadequate yet God did great things through them and I think we, we might seem small but I think there's a lot that God's going to do through us and mm -hmm. Absolutely, Jenny. Yeah, so that's all I wrote. <laughs> Amen. So, good word.